Good morning. How are you? Uh, before we get started, I wanted to share a message from Judy DePue with you. Uh, she will be here with us in second service, Lord willing. Uh, she was with us last week. She just uh, so fresh off the passing of her husband. She'd like to say it herself, but she can't. Uh, she appreciates uh, the love of the church during the last couple of years uh, that he struggled and that uh, she ministered there to him and they both missed us. She's glad to be back in church, but uh, her obvious desire was to be here with him and she can't be. So she just wanted to tell you thank you. Thank you for all the cards, the calls, uh, the funeral, uh, the people that showed up, the, the food that you brought. She's just truly, truly grateful and I wanted me to share that with you. All right, well, uh, welcome back. I'm Pastor David. If I don't know you, uh, I know you now. Thanks for being here. This is Holy Week. This is, uh, for Christians, this is a time that, that we should be celebrating. We're going to talk about that today. Uh, Christmas is great, but Easter is the hinge of our beliefs. And so uh, I'm excited about it. I hope you're excited about it. We're uh, in the uh, Gospel of Mark. If you're not with us regularly, we're walking through the Gospel of Mark. We've gotten all the way up to the eighth chapter, halfway through the book. And the first part of the book has been to identify who Jesus is. As we just recently finished up, uh, he finally put everybody on the spot. He says, all right, you've seen everything you need to see. Who am I? Who do you say that I am? And, and so Peter uh, properly answers, you are the Christ. You're the Messiah. And so we've got this group of people now who uh, two and a half years into Jesus's ministry, they get it. All right, you're the Messiah. Now we're fast forwarding a little bit. We're stepping out of Mark. We'll pick it up in a few weeks. Uh, I'm going to pick up in the Gospel of Luke. It's about six months later. Six months after that proclamation, Jesus is now uh, saying, all right, Jews, uh, Jerusalem, now who do you say that I am? Jesus says, I've shown you everything you need to see. In the three years of my ministry, I've taught, uh, I've fulfilled prophecies, and, and I've, I've showed you exactly who I am. Now he's marching into Jerusalem to say, it's time. It's time for you to commit. Who do you say that I am? So this, this is a great opportunity for us. It, as Christians, it reminds us of who he is. And as unbelievers, this is a chance to make that proclamation too. So we're going to go there. We're going to, I think it's 631 in your blue Bibles underneath your seat. It's Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, starting at verse 28. So won't you stand with me to honor the reading of God's word. Uh, we're reading a very familiar passage, a triumphal entry, as recorded by another eyewitness, uh, Luke. And we'll pick up in verse 28 of chapter 19 of Luke's gospel. It says, after telling this story, so we, we're continuing a thought, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem, walking ahead of his disciples. As he came to the towns of Bethpage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives, he sent two disciples ahead. Go into that village over there, he told them. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying that colt? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying that colt? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their garments over it for him to ride on. As they rode along, the crowd spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles that they had seen. Blessings on the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. He replied, If they keep quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. But as he came closer to Jerusalem and saw the city ahead, he began to weep. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. Before long, your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on you from every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not accept your opportunity for salvation. Powerful statement. Let's pray. Father, those of us who have uh, come to that realization by your divine revelation that Jesus is the Messiah, we are truly grateful for the season we enter. It is so exciting to be reminded of who Jesus is and what he means to us. And this entry today uh, just shows us the Prince of Peace came. He came for us and he died for us so that we could have that peace. So thank you for that. I ask that you encourage us today to live in that peace. 
remind us of the value of it. And God, just continue to change us to be more like your son, Jesus Christ, before we leave. And I talk about the we's and the us, that's believers. A majority of people in this room have come to know Christ already. But if there's anybody here who's not a Christian, still trying to figure this out, or maybe just came to appease someone else, I pray that they'll understand that every time they hear the truth, they have an obligation. Will they proclaim Jesus as Messiah or not? The answer to that question changes everything for eternity. So God, may they hear the word today. May the truth touch their hearts. And may they understand you're a God of love and a God of mercy. And in your love and mercy, you sent Jesus Christ to die for them. Maybe this will be the day of their salvation. Bless your word. Remove me from it. Speak through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated. Many of you are like me. You grew up in church. um, And you know what to expect on on Easter and Palm Sunday. By the way, that's what this is called. Uh, As you'll hear in just a minute, this is Palm Sunday. Um, and, and we kind of, I don't know, we kind of get used to the story and we kind of ho-hum about it. But this is, this is really exciting and I hope I can break it out in a way uh, that will be fresh to you as it is to me because these truths are critical for us. Let's begin with the grand entrance. Um, Luke described a grand entrance that would may confuse us given how things happen for us today. Um, if we saw someone important entering a city on a donkey, it really wouldn't phase us. But in their culture, it was a really, really big deal. Uh, And so Jesus sends in his disciples. He says, go and get a young donkey that's not been ridden on and bring it to me. And again, we see divine intervention here as the owner says, all right, take him. But this is significant for two reasons. The first is the symbol of peace. The donkey is the symbol of peace. You and I, when we we see grand entrances today, we see stretch Humvees, we see quarter million dollar sports cars, whatever it is, someone influential enters today, um, they enter in a big way. And they would have back then too. A king or a conquering uh, victor would have entered a city on a huge horse that would have had the bridles with the studs and the gold and the gems. I mean, it would have been a royal proclamation for someone of influence to enter a town back then if they were coming as a victor. But Jesus enters it in a different way. Back then, if a king would enter a city on a donkey, it meant he was entering in peace. I mean, he wasn't bringing war. He was bringing just the opposite. He was coming in peace. So when Jesus comes into the city, he is making that clear proclamation that Isaiah prophesied 800 years before because he said he would be the prince of peace. And now here comes Jesus entering the city on the donkey properly, not as this, this violent victor, but as this one bringing peace. Obviously, they weren't looking for this. The Jews of that day didn't want peace. They wanted someone to come in and take over the Romans. They they wanted a king to come in on that big horse with a sword and to release them from their oppression. But Jesus was giving them something more than that. He offered something more than a temporary release of the problems. He was offering them eternal peace. That's the significance or the symbol that the donkey was. The second thing that was important about him coming in on the donkey is it's the fulfillment of prophecy. Okay? It's the fulfillment of prophecy. I don't know what you think about today when you hear the word prophecy, but uh, we've seen a lot of goofy stuff in our lifetime. We've seen a lot of doomsday cult, the Haley Bob stuff. Um, we, we see a lot of really uh, false prophecy in our times, and it really turns people away. And anytime somebody says it's a prophecy, you're like, ah. Well, back in those days, it was huge. Back in the first century, prophecy was very, very important. The Jews believed in prophecy. And they had books of prophecy, the ones that you and I have in the Old Testament. And in those books, there were several important prophecies. We covered them last week. Uh, They said that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. They said that he would come out of Egypt, and he did. They said that he would be in Nazareth, and he was. They said he would be born of a virgin, and he was. Jesus fulfilled all of these prophecies, and it continued. I believe there's like 29 prophecies by the end of this holy week that Jesus will fulfill, and this was another one. The prophet Zechariah, 500 AD or BC, wrote this. He said in Zechariah 9, 9, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look for your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he's humble. Riding on what? A donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. So 500 years before Jesus' birth, God spoke through Zechariah to tell his people to expect this to happen. Your king will enter the city on the back 
of a donkey. And so that's the significance. That's the grand entrance. That's why it's important. Again, it wasn't what they were expecting, but it's what they should have been expecting. The Prince of Peace coming in to fulfill prophecy, to say, look, Jesus is boldly stating by coming in on a donkey, it's me, the one you've been waiting for, the chosen one, the Messiah, I'm him. I am the Messiah. That's the statement that he's making. Some got it. Let's talk about the ones who got it and the roar of the crowd. There are those, as you saw the kids this morning, uh, that in, in the other gospels share about the palm branches. Uh, we see in Luke's gospel, they're taking off their coats. Uh, they're taking off their outer garments and they're literally laying them on the ground in front of the donkey. Uh, you and I, again, don't recognize that custom. We recognize rolling out the red carpet, right? We would roll out the red carpet for someone uh, who was important to us and influential to make their entrance. Well, they used their coats. They laid down their clothes and let the donkey walk on the back of their coats. That's signifying that they get it. They understand who he is and they are welcoming him. Now, the reason some of them welcome him and some of them are ready for him is stated in the passage. One of the things that they understand are the miracles. The miracles. The followers, the ones who are shouting, Hosanna, uh, blessed, it comes here in the name of the Lord. They have realized the power that is right in front of them. We've been talking about it. Um, Jesus is the one who turned the water into wine. That wasn't in our, our list of miracles. Uh, what was is he was the one who calmed the storm on the Sea of Galilee. We did see that. He was the one who cast out legions of demons. We saw that. He is the one who multiplied the, the bread and the fish and fed thousands of people, not just once, but twice, Jews and Gentiles. We saw that. He's the one that healed leprosy. He's the one that could cure the one who was unclean and, and bring them to a state of being clean. We saw that. He's the one who could raise the daughter of the Jewish leader uh, from death. We saw that. Uh, recently in the story, again, uh, just before this happens, he does something incredible that we don't cover in the Gospel of Mark yet. We, we get to Lazarus. Lazarus is one of his friends. He's very close to Lazarus. And Jesus is away doing some ministry. And Mary and Martha sent for Jesus. He said, hey, you're the friend, the guy you love, he's sick and he's dying. You need to come. You need to heal him. And Jesus purposely waits several days to let his friend die. And then he comes back and gets to the tomb and says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus is raised from the dead. That's recently happened before they're shouting Hosanna. He is there in the crowd. Lazarus, the one that was raised from the dead, is there. So they know. They know the power that Jesus has. They know very clearly that he is of God, that he is the divine one because of the things that they've seen. That's what it said. They were shouting because of the miracles. They're also following him because of his teachings. This is not stated here, but we see it all through our Gospel of Mark that we've been studying. Uh, Jesus was an authoritative teacher. Back in those days, um, the, the Jewish leaders had turned God's word into something that God never intended, a beating stick. It still happens today, doesn't it? You go to church and you feel like you've been hit in the stomach every time you leave because the, the word of God is used in a hurtful way. And that's the way they were using it. They had come up with, <laughs> they had dissected their Old Testament and they had literally laid out 600 plus laws, do's and don'ts. They had this list of things you do to make God happy, you don't do uh, to make God unhappy. And there were over 600 of them. And they had developed this whole religion around the do's and don'ts of God's law. That's not what God intended. God didn't mean on his, his word to be some cookie cutter list of do's and don'ts. He meant for his word to reveal his character and who he is. And so when Jesus came, it was refreshing. When Jesus taught, he said, you've heard it said, but I say. You've heard it said, but I say. You've heard all the laws and the legalistic things and you've been hurt by God's word. Now let me tell you what God intended. Let me tell you that God, yes, is a righteous God, that he, he does have do's and don'ts. He does have ways he expects you to live and not to live, but he's a merciful God. You see, they had left that out. God is a loving God. God is a gracious God. God is a God who forgives. And Jesus is teaching the whole truth, the whole character of God. And so they're drawn to him in throngs. They follow him in great crowds because of the miracles and because of the teaching. And so these people, they really get it. Jesus is the Messiah. They understand. And so they are shouting, 
hosannas and they're praising God because they realized here he is entering the city on a donkey just the way he's supposed to. So they get it. These are the followers. These are the crowds. These are the ones celebrating. But I want to focus on the rest for the rest of the time. I want to focus on the reason why he was weeping. I chose uh, Luke because it brings out an element that I think is critical in our culture today. Let's talk about the weeping Messiah. Um, you and I would love to receive this kind of reception, wouldn't we? If we showed up and people were shouting for us and they were celebrating for us and they were laying out the red carpet for us and they were just treating us with this kind of respect and we would be really excited about it. We would be pretty, feeling pretty good that people cared about us, that they, they really wanted us to be around. Um, but Jesus was heartbroken. This, this is the contrast. They're all celebrating, shouting Hosanna. He's surrounded by his followers. But Jesus is heartbroken. It says when he came down the Mount of Olives, it's really neat. When you come across the Mount of Olives, you go down into the valley. But as you come across the Mount, you can see the Eastern Gate and you can see where the temple would be. And so he is looking right there across the valley to where the temple is. And instead of celebrating, he's weeping. He's crying. He's crying over Jerusalem. The reason he's crying is, is because it was not enough just to have a few followers that were celebrating. Um, God loves everybody, not just a few. There's a fundamental truth that we all know. John 3, 16 tells us, for this is how uh, God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that who? So that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. They say, yeah, Jesus was, I'm sure, happy that he had this group of people that got it, that the 12 disciples understood that there were others now who were really getting uh, the prophecies and they're really getting the miracles. All right, it's clicking with some, but there are still those people, and you can picture it as Jesus is entering the city, who are um, pulling their kids in, right? They're, they're pulling their kids in, they're closing their doors, they're closing their shutters, they got their arms crossed. I can't do that today, so it's okay. I, I would give you the illustration, but that's a bad thing. Um, they got their arms crossed and their furrowed brow, and uh, they don't care. No matter what they've heard, no matter what they see, they're rejecting him, okay? The rejection is the reason Jesus is weeping. Because these people, they've seen everything they need to see. They've heard everything they need to hear. None of this was done in a vacuum. Jesus is in Galilee. He's doing all these things. They have sent Jewish leaders up to Galilee to, to evaluate what he's done. Uh, they've heard his teaching. Again, just like with Peter, who do you say that I am? When Jesus came into that city, there was no longer an excuse. This was a, this was a transition. A transition for many for eternal life, but a transmission for, or transmission, transition for many for condemnation. Because rejecting Jesus has a price. And Jesus knew that there were those in that city who it didn't matter how many miracles he performed. It didn't matter how much he taught. It didn't matter how many prophecies he fulfilled. They weren't going to take him. They weren't going to accept him. Why? Kind of touched on it a minute ago. They wanted relief today. They wanted somebody to come in and run out the Romans. They, they wanted their life to be better today. What's Jesus going to do for me today? Okay, I don't want you talking about the future. Leave me alone about that. Right now, my life is horrible. Right now, my life is, is awful. What is Jesus going to do for me right here and right now? And so they rejected Jesus because he wasn't offering them that temporary, tangible uh, relief that they wanted. He was offering them something much more that they missed. Remember, he's offering them peace. Peace through their troubles. Peace through their oppression. Peace through their heartaches. Jesus is offering a greater gift, but they don't want it. They reject him. And that rejection comes with a very heavy price. Let's talk about the coming judgment. Jesus, being God and man, knew what rejection cost. He knew what was going to happen. It's about 40 years later after this that the judgment comes. Okay, Jesus mentions it himself. He says this in, in verse 44. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in place. Why? Because you did not accept your opportunity for salvation. You see, this is Titus. We know historically what happened about 40 years later. It's the next generation. These people who are rejecting him, it's their children who are going to suffer. 
Titus will come in. He'll bring in the Romans. There'll be, a, there'll be an uprising among the Jews trying to get out from under oppression. It doesn't work. And so the Romans come in and they just destroy Jerusalem. They destroy the temple. Uh, they set up the, the sacrifice, the abomination, the desolation. Um, they come in and they literally don't leave one stone left on another. They had laid siege to the city. And if you understand the way war happened back then, they had high walls. That was their defense because they didn't have helicopters and airplanes and projectiles. So there was big walls around the city. And so the, the bat combative army would just come up and lock them in. They would shut them down and they would just starve them. And that's what happened to Jerusalem that time. Just starved them out. They had no food. They had no water. Uh, and the people were dying. And so when they were finally so weak that they could enter the city, they just crushed them. The Romans crushed the, the Jewish people who were left there, brutalized them, murdered them, women, children, men. It was horrible. And Jesus saw that. Jesus knew that. He knew what was going to happen. He knew there were consequences to rejecting him. That's why he wept. Sure, it was great that people were celebrating him. But he didn't want to see anyone suffer. It, it doesn't please the Lord that anyone suffers. Right, Ezekiel thirty three eleven tells us that. Uh, he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from their way and live. And so Jesus wept because many rejected him and he knew the consequences that would follow. So what do you do with something like this? What do you do with Palm Sunday? How do you react to it? How do you respond? Well, there are two specific things we can take away when we leave here today uh, that are very, very practical. Let's start with the first. Let's look at the response of those who were following him. It says in verse 37, all of his followers, and most of us in this room will fit into that category, all of his followers began to shout and sing as they walked along, praising God for all the wonderful miracles they had seen. So, given day on Sunday, most of the people here are Christians, or at least you claim to be a Christian. You're a follower. You're in that group that should be shouting Hosanna. <laughs> You're in that group that should be praising God for all the wonderful things he's done for you. Are you? Okay, it's a simple question, right? We come to church, Palm Sunday, we see the kids sing an awesome song, waving their palm branches. Dale and the worship team leads us in, blessed be your name. I mean, great, awesome, awesome stuff. What are you gonna do when you leave here? What's Holy Week gonna look like to other people around you? Are you going to be praising God? Are you gonna be living out this, this celebratory life that these great miracle, miraculous things have happened, the greatest miracle of all, you've been saved? You've been taken from eternally condemned to eternally saved and it's all because of Jesus. You understood who he was and you believed in him unto salvation. Are you gonna be celebrating, right? Are the people gonna see you celebrating who Jesus is? Not just this week, but every week. Look in the mirror. Would you be considered to be a part of that group who are celebrating Jesus? The other part is, Jesus came to bring what? He came to bring peace. He came to bring peace in a troubled world. Is our world troubled today? Boy, is it. Anybody watch the news? I don't anymore. It's awful. Uh, but the news this week has been pretty, pretty, uh, pretty tough. Um, you know, there's a lot of people worried about, talking about Christians here, by the way, uh, worried about a political situation. It's pretty polarized, isn't it? It's awful. It pits people against each other, Christian against Christian, and our beliefs and our social justices and things like that. Uh, we are so divided. That robs us of peace, doesn't it? Um, missiles have been fired into an enemy country. Uh, so it like, seems like we're on a verge of war. That robs us of our peace, doesn't it? There are so many things going on in our country and in our world that rob us of our peace. What about individually? We just talked about folks like Michaela uh, who are dealing with cancer. Man, it just seems like the, the diagnosis of cancer is just multiplying. And it just, it just seems like it's getting worse and worse. The physical ailments and disabilities that we're dealing with, it robs us of our peace, doesn't it? It can do that. Um, and, and then there's, there's death. We celebrated Harold's life recently. Uh, we're seeing you know, a lot. Uh, Richard passed away, Richard Harris. Uh, that, that can rob us of our peace. And then there's overt sin. Obviously, we see uh, the church members are just as guilty of it as anyone else. Uh, marriages being broken up, addictions happening in lives, people giving up control. There's so many ways that we, we lose our peace, but that shouldn't be. Prince of Peace came in on a donkey showing that, that he came to bring peace and gives us peace. He even says himself, John's Gospel, uh, 1427, I love this passage. I'm leaving you with what? A gift. What is that gift? Peace of mind and heart. 
And the peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. In other words, it's just uh, that people can't understand this gift. So don't be troubled or be afraid. If we truly believe, if we are in that crowd celebrating who Jesus is, we've received this gift, shouldn't we be living in it? Are you living in the peace that he offers? Does the world see that even though you're going through trials, even though we've got a lot of conflict, even though things are divisive, that you still have peace about you? Because, yeah, this is Easter and they may come to church. We call them creasters. Hopefully that doesn't offend anybody. Those who come Christmas and Easter, creasters, they come twice a year. Um, that's good. It's a good thing. Because at least they know that there's something here. There's something they need. And, and again, they'll be here, but there's so many that won't, right? There's a lot of people in your life at work and in your neighborhood, at the ball field, uh, in your family, who aren't going to darken the doors of the church, are they? They're not going to come in here. It's just not going to happen. You are the only evidence of the Messiah that they're going to have. You are the one that they're going to look to. You are the one that they're going to listen to. You are the one that they're going to see whether or not you're celebrating what Christ has done for you. You are the one they're going to see whether or not you're living in the peace that he brings. You are the evidence of the coming Messiah. Will you be that evidence? That's what I got out of this study. And that's what I encourage you with as believers. Look in the mirror today. Are you celebrating? Are you living in peace? If not, let's deal with that this morning and ask him to help us. The rest, the others that don't believe, the ones that reject, maybe there's somebody here who's rejected him. I don't know why people come to church. I know that God draws you here. Uh, but if you've rejected him, this, this is important to see. Jesus says, how I wish that you, okay, you would understand the way to peace. As you heard, Jesus was brokenhearted. He was brokenhearted because there's condemnation for that rejection. There's a permanent judgment that comes for saying, I don't care about Jesus. I don't care what he's done. I don't care what he has said. I just don't believe in all that stuff. It's not for me. There is a consequence to that. As you heard, there is judgment for that. But it doesn't have to happen. I shared with you the way uh, to have this peace. It says, for God so loved the world. This is on your handout. This is the last thing I want you to listen to and hear before you go home because this is foundational. He gave his one and only son, why? So that everyone who what? Believes, has faith in him, will not perish but have eternal life. Let me explain by forwarding the clock a few days. Uh, this is Holy Day or Holy Week. Jesus enters the city. There's a lot that goes on during this week. Most of it centers around him teaching his disciples about how to take the next step. All right, he's teaching his disciples what to do after he dies. He gets very personal with them. He gets very close to them. But he gets down to the end of the week, and, and surely it does happen. Those who rejected him when he came in, they're now shouting, crucify him. Because they've turned him over. The Jewish leaders finally got to the point they'd had enough. Jesus was upsetting their, their cart. And so they bring him before the judges in the middle of the night, which was illegal. They beat him, which was illegal. They brought uh, liars to, to say things about him, which was illegal. But then Jesus does finally condemn himself when he says, that, yeah, he is equal to God. And to them, that's it. That's all they need to hear. They turn him over to the Romans. The Romans don't want anything to do with him. They can't find anything wrong with him. They try to appease the, the bloodlust of the crowd by having him scourged. They strapped him down and they ripped the flesh off of his back with these whips. They had many strips of leather with little pieces of bone or metal in the end of them that would have just literally ripped the flesh off of his back. They thought maybe, just maybe, that'll satisfy these crazy people, but it wouldn't. The ones who rejected him continued to say, crucify him, crucify him. So this, it's like, ah, that's it, you can have him. And so they did. He carried his cross up to Golgotha. They nailed him on that cross and he died. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus died so that he could forgive us of our sins and show us that we could be right with God. Thankfully, we get to celebrate next week the most exciting day on planet Earth. The day that the tomb was empty. Because three days later, by the power of God, he got up and he walked out to show, guess what? Death is not the end. The grave doesn't win. You will have eternal life, and if you believe in me, you will live even after dying, Jesus says. And that's the celebration we all look forward to, those of us who are his followers. And you can look forward to him as well. How does it happen? 
Well, a lot of people have all these different things you got to do. A lot of faiths have things you got to practice, uh, ways you got to live. Um, I love the illustration of the cross and the two that were with Jesus. Just as prophesied, Jesus would be crucified with two criminals. They were murderous thieves, one on each side. One of them makes fun of Jesus and mocks him. The other one, reality sets in. He gets it. Finally, in his last moments on earth, the other thief realizes who Jesus is and he simply turns and says to him, as the scriptures tell us, remember me. A thief, the, the murderous thief, the one who's done nothing right ever in his life. He's ne never done anything good. He's never gone to church. He's never read a Bible. He's never wore a tie, <laughs> a righteous outfit. Um, he, he's never been baptized. He's never done anything. None of these things that we see as holy has ever happened to this guy. And then he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me. Most of us know Jesus' response. Today you'll be with me in paradise. Can I explain salvation? Absolutely not. I can say the scriptures say believe in Jesus Christ. Believe, and that means not just a head knowledge. That not, means not just something academic. It means believing to the point that you fully surrender your life to follow in him, that he and he alone is your Messiah. If you're ready for that today, the answer is simply to come forward and say, I, I want to follow Jesus, okay? Uh, so we're going to sing a song, or Dale is going to sing a song. It's a gorgeous song. It's about this situation I just explained. And again, I know it's kind of, it feels kind of creepy. What, would you, what am I supposed to do? Just come to the front. If you realize who Jesus is and you don't want to reject him anymore, just come and let one of us know. And we'd love to pray with you. God, thank you for what you've done. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this reminder. Uh, bless us, those who are your followers, uh, with a fresh zeal for living in excitement, uh, not dread, uh, in, in the light of what Jesus has done for us. Uh, please strengthen our peace. It's, it's an unearthly peace. It's a peace that people should see but not understand. And it should lead them to ask us why we have it. And so God, please encourage us as followers what we need to look like and how we need to live uh, in order to see your kingdom grow on this earth. For those who have rejected you, um, may they see the tears of Jesus Christ, the ones he shed for them. Because there are terrible consequences for dying after rejecting Jesus Christ. So God, maybe this will be the day that they understand that they're loved, that the price for their sins was paid through Jesus on the cross of Calvary, and that they, just like Jesus, can have eternal life. God, maybe this will be the day they have that courage to come forward and say, I don't know what else to do, but I want to follow Jesus. He will change their life. He will save their soul. So God, please give them the strength to do that. I ask these things in your precious son's name, Jesus. Amen. This is your time to respond.